for the people who did listen to my lightning talk yesterday, you are not going to answer this question. Only those who did not listen to me yesterday is supposed to do this one. Do you think I can talk for eight hours straight without any breaks at all about passwords and call that a brief introduction to the topic? Raise your hand if you think I can do that. <laughs> People know me already. Okay. <laughs> and for those who did listen to me yesterday, do you agree? Yes. Well, yeah, it's true. I haven't done it for real, but I do think that I can talk for eight hours and still call that a very brief introduction to this topic. So my name is Per. I did this joke yesterday. I'm not going to repeat it and blah, blah, blah. Cormac thinks I'm crazy. That's rather true. Um, and I'm 50 years old. I have a daughter aged 15 and she finds it very embarrassing that her dad has a YouTube channel. Because I run my own conference called PasswordsCon, a nonprofit where we only talk about passwords and digital authentication in all shapes, forms, and sizes. So you can find it there. I have tons of talks, and it's not just me, but lots of other people that are really good at this topic that you can watch for free as much as you want. I also talked yesterday about the value of a password, exemplified by this story from Associated, Associated Press on Twitter. Uh, many years ago, they tweeted out this message saying that there had been an explosion in the White House and uh, Barack Obama has been, had been injured. That was fake news. It was only reported by AP and that resulted in the Dow Jones stock index dropping by $136.5 billion. And this happened because a single employee at the Associated Press fall, fell victim to a phishing mail and handed out the username and the password for the Twitter AP account. And they did not have two-factor authentication at the time of Twitter, so that was it. One username, one password, and suddenly you have a stock market drop of $136.5 billion. That's massive. And even crazier is the hack was done by the Syrian Electronic Army. They said they were state fans of President Bashar al-Assad, or maybe they were uh, state-sponsored hackers or working for the government, or maybe it was something else. We don't know. And we don't know if the Syrian regime or any other regime made any money out of doing that hack. But that's, again, to me, the value of a single password, a single user account in the worst possible way. So I will start out with giving you a couple of password recommendations. I made this by invitation from the National Cybersecurity Alliance in the US. It's the government and it's the big, big tech companies that are all part of this uh, alliance. Uh, these recommendations were released for the World Password Day in 2016. It's true, there's a World Password Day. And in 2016, it was actually on May 4th. May the 4th be with you. So it's that easy to remember. So, recommendation number one from my side is make your password a sentence. I don't know for English and US or English speaking people if the word passphrase means anything to you, but in Norwegian, passphrase is not something, it's not a word that my mother understands. And most Norwegians don't really understand what you mean with passphrase. But a passphrase is something as simple as a sentence. And the funny thing is, even today, there's a lot of people out there that don't know they can use spaces in their passwords because a password is a single word to most people. But you can actually write a standard Norwegian, German, Russian, Japanese sentence with spaces between the characters, if you like, or between the words, and use that as your password in most systems. That's what I do. That's what I want you to tell your family and your friends and colleagues. Yes, you can use space in your passwords. Use a normal positive sentence about something that you want to remember. Number two, and I'm sorry to say this, but for every unique account you have, you really should have a unique password. You're smiling, yes. I have more than 500 accounts, and no, I'm not a friggin' genius. So I use a password manager. And using a password manager goes into 
trick number three, write down your passwords. Now, many years ago, I went to visit my parents back home in, in Haugesen, west coast of Norway. And I told my mother that, Mom, you should write down your passwords. Uh, she doesn't have many of them. She's uh, retired now, and so is my dad. But I said to her, you should write down your passwords. And she just looked at me like, no. I read in the newspaper, so you're not supposed to do that. And I said, well, don't listen to the newspapers. Listen to me, because I'm a global password security expert or something like that. And she's like, no. Well, I mean, you do a lot of talks. I know that, but still, I, you know, I trust the newspapers for some reason. Um, and I said, well, let's, you know, let's be logical here, Mom. Uh, do you have any enemies? And she's like, what? what? Do you have any, any enemies or anyone who wants to kill you or steal your money? Well, nobody wants to kill me and steal my money. I, I mean, well, there are bad people on the internet. I've read that in the newspapers. Well, that's true. But if you write down your passwords and put them in your kitchen drawer or, or, or in closet in your bedroom or something like that, who would be interested in stealing that piece of paper? I have two younger sisters. Would I like to do that, or would my sisters do that? Well, if we did, for the purpose of face raping your Facebook account or for stealing your money, you know, there, there, there would be a family meeting. I'm pretty sure of that. And to the extent there is any money left, I'm not getting them if I hack your bank account. And I'm pretty sure the same applies for my sisters as well. Now, I may be wrong, but I don't think Chinese or Russian intelligence is interested in going to Hogerson and find out where you live and break into your house to steal that paper to steal your pension fund. And I, 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 I don't know how large your pension fund is, but you have a normal house and you have a normal car and you've got that as well. So I, I guess it's, you know, it's, well, it's worth the trip to Hogerson, but it, it's really not, you know, there are other more interesting targets. And then there's just one risk left, and that's dad. Now, if dad were to face rape your Facebook account, th that would just be funny. But it, it's, it's, not, it's not a problem. And dad wouldn't steal your money. I, you're, you're married. Uh, and I sp suppose you will stay married as well. So write down your passwords, uh, because that is so much smarter to do than having people use the same shitty password across all possible services. And just telling them that when you write down your passwords, of course, obviously, number two, use unique passwords for each account and write it down or use a password manager. I would never enforce a password manager on my parents because it's just too technically advanced. They don't know they are running Windows or iOS or Mac OS on the computer, and they don't care. And not, most importantly, they are not in interested in learning about it either. It just wanted to work. And last but not least, from the password guy himself, use two-factor authentication everywhere you can. If, and especially if, you think the account is worthy of any kind of protection. Because passwords are not enough. Yes, I said it. And I also have good news for you. Now, this isn't really good news. Maybe you've seen this before, maybe you've heard this one before. But the next slide will bring you some news that will give you so much joy that I hope and I believe that you, you will applaud it. Maybe you'll whistle, maybe you will even stand up and clap your hands and whistle and say, yes, love it. And if anybody wants to give me a hug after the talk, I'm, you know, I'm available as well for that. Are you ready for some great news? Oh, it's that early. Are you ready for some great news? Yes. Let's give it a try. Okay, so mandatory and frequent change of passwords are stupid. <laughs> yes, excellent. Because when you enforce this upon people, you are actually decreasing security, believe it or not. I will get back into that. It destroys the user experience, and you knew that from before, and it's a waste of valuable time. Why should you change your password when it hasn't been breached? There's no reason to think your account has been breached. Nothing like that, but you still need to change it. There's absolutely no, no point in doing that. So, a couple of years ago, this is 2019, Microsoft says, 
In a blog post, periodic password expiration is an ancient and obsolete mitigation of very low value, and we don't believe it's worthwhile for our baseline to enforce any specific value. So it's not just me. Microsoft as well. Hooray for Microsoft. I've been saying it since 2010, but that's just me. But talking about passwords, I have a very important question for you. And I need, I need you to sort of think about this question, because this is really, really important for the rest of my talk, basically. And that question is, do you need an account for that? Do I need to configure an account with you in order to use your services online? When you go to the grocery store to buy milk, do they ask you for a user account, for a password or PIN in order to enter the store? Anyone? North Korea, maybe, but... Just by leaving, pay. <laughs> when you leave, you have to pay, yes. But that is not like authenticating in any way, it's just paying, which is fair, fair enough, I, I do understand. Yeah, they want to get paid. But this question is incredibly important because in a lot of cases, there's actually no need to create or use an account at all. I want to purchase new shoes from your online store. Give me, you know, show me the shoes available. Let me pick the one that I like. Enter my shipping details, enter my credit card details, which is probably being entered into a third party payment provider anyway, and tell me, Excellent, congratulations on your new shoes. They are now leaving uh, our store and they will be with you in one, two or three days. Now, that's easy to do. But why then, when I enter a new website I've never been to, they, one of the first things they ask me is, would you like to log in? Would you like to create an account? Or you have to log in before you can use any services here at all. Marketing purposes, they want to spam me but that is not really helping me. It's like, would you like to have our newsletter come in directly to your mailbox like four times a day because there are so many good offers for you? Well, I've never been here before. I just want to look at what kind of shoes you have. Do they do this in grocery stores? Like when you enter the door, you've never been there before. Like, hey, welcome. Let's show you around. Here's milk, here's chocolate, here's biscuits, and here's... Uh, fruit and vegetables, and here's the meat, and here's the fish, and everything. Uh, no, 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 you can't pick anything yet. We have to show you around everything, and we need to send you physical letters with offers in the mail. They don't do that. Now, changing the flow of this is something I will get back to, but I think that good user experience also provides for good security. People, and I know this from experience, I've been working with information security since 1995, so I'm really old. And I know from experience that if security is hard for users to use, they will do anything they can to circumvent or to break the security, and they will not tell security staff, because those guys are morons anyway. So you have to make security that works for people. So let's talk a little bit about the onboarding and login process flow, like, you know, creating a new account because I want to buy some new shoes. Again, I'm asking the question, why do I need an account with you? Here's a create a new account form, and you, as you can see, I have incredibly delicate design skills in PowerPoint. So in a create a new account, it's very common to see that enter your email because that will be your username and then you have to create a password and you have to enter the password to confirm. You can still find a lot of websites that does, does the last part there. Enter password one more time to confirm. First of all, something simple you can do, you can use focus so that as soon as I enter the web page, the cursor is inside the email box and I can start typing. I don't have to use my mouse cursor to place it in there and click and then start writing. Incredibly small, but very important usability step. You can also allow me to choose a username. Anyone on Twitter? Probably some of you on Twitter. Twitter allows you to log in using an email address 
or your phone number associated with your account, or your Twitter handle. My Twitter handle is my last name, Torsheim. My email address is something at torsheim.net. I, I have the domain, obviously, pair at torsheim.net. But it's faster for me, if I'm going to type it in, it's faster for me to just type in Torsheim. Now, if you allow users to pick a username, not just an email, or they can log in using the phone number uh, as an example, it will be easier for them to log in. And you could eventually also allow people to choose what would you like to use to log in, a username, a phone number, an email address, or you know, something else. Because that could be sort of a secret. Because most people don't consider a username to be a secret because it's an email address, it's your email address, which is public information mostly. But why can't a username also be a secret? Or at least a semi-secret. So there are pros and cons of using, uh, allowing usernames instead of just email addresses as usernames. Uh, and you need to consider this, obviously, in, in every single case. And then you also have the password requirements. Password requirements can be found everywhere, and it's just, again, plain friggin' stupid to do. Requiring people to use three out of four, four character groups, uppercase, lowercase, uh, numbers and uh, digits and special characters, it's stupid. Because we know, password crackers like me, we know that if you ask the people to create a complex password, the first letter will be uppercase, the rest will be lowercase, and at the end you have an exclamation mark. The exclamation mark is being used twice as much as all the other special characters on your keyboard in passwords. Password, exclamation mark, woohoo. Amazing security, very predictable. So remove the password complexity requirements because length by itself creates complexity. You could also consider implementing a client-side password generator because people are not creative. A lot of you are not creative. So when you ask people, hey, Create a password and do it now. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, exclamation mark. Oh shit, that's too short. Password, exclamation mark. That works. So why not suggest a password or a passphrase? This is my beloved passphrase, exclamation mark, because I'm predictable. You could do that. You could suggest two or three or four random words from a word list. There's a methodology for that called Diceware, which is cryptographically secure. If you pick uh, three or four random words from a word list that contains approximately seven and a half thousand words, you have so many combinations available that it is impossible to crack it cryptographically, which is pretty awesome. Uh, what you could also do, what you should do, is to implement a feature in the password field where you can choose to show or hide the password. I had a discussion a couple of years ago in Las Vegas with some usability uh, designers, and they were really proud because they had implemented this feature. And I looked at the web page and they had this open eye saying, hey, now you can see the password, and closed eye, it, you know, it's not visible. And I said, well, have you watched Lord of the Rings? Uh, or have you <coughs> have had a look at the US dollar bills? <laughs> a single eye in certain religions is an evil eye, like in Lord of the Rings. So trying to get away, don't use religious symbols, is a tip for you. Try to avoid that. Instead, you can implement something as simple as using the text show and hide in here to show or hide the password in the password login field. And also this field, you know, the confirm your password is basically redundant if you implement especially the show hide option, then you don't have to enter the password once more to confirm. And then you make the create a login process is suddenly faster to do. And last but not least for this screen, I would also really uh, suggest for you to implement a password strength meter. This is simple gamification. 
if you are being told or shown that your password right now is red, like you enter 133456, it's red. But if it is, this is my beloved passphrase, exclamation mark, period, then you would have a green score. And people want, in general, they want to be good, they want to do good. So if you implement the gamification like this, that actually increases password strength and password security. With one exception, Cormac Hurley at Microsoft Research, he did a paper on this, he looked into gamification and he said, gamification works. Haha, -ha, big surprise, we knew that. But he also found that if you use gamification for password strength, for a site or a service that doesn't matter to the user. I mean, I'm signing up for your online shoe store for the very first time ever. You want my name and address and phone number, which is public information anyway. And then you ask me to set a strong password and there's a password strength meter. Even then I'm like, yeah, but it's just a shoe store and they're just asking me for name, address and phone number. So, you know, I, I don't care about this account at all. It has no value to me. And that's one of the things you need to be aware of when you have users or new customers signing up. Initially, when they sign up, that account has absolutely zero value to them. So they are most likely to choose a very simple password. They may even enter uh, wrong information. They don't care, false information, because they just want to look around. And you should be aware of that in the context that at some point, when they're going to do a financial transaction, if they're going to enter a credit card, if they're going to purchase any, anything expensive or leave any kind of sensitive information, that's the point in time where sh you should like care for the user and say, okay, well, now you're going to enter sensitive information about yourself, personally sensitive information. Now would be, would be, would be like a good time to configure two-factor authentication, wouldn't it? Instead of doing that initially, because then you have lots of people dropping off on the onboarding process. Uh, Two-factor authentication, oh, come on, man, I just want to have a look at the shoes. So they will just drop out. So your password contains invalid characters. And uh, from many years ago, uh, because this is the wrong audience to say this to, no, your startup contains incompetent engineers. And uh, it was Haribel Thomas who tweeted that, so it's, it's not me saying that. But he's sort of correct. Your password, anyone's password, should be it should be possible to use pretty much anything, even the incredibly dangerous SQL injection characters, Scott. Um, and uh, again, <laughs> learn some basic hygiene, learn some basic uh, input output controls, learn how to check if. <laughs> learn how to handle your password correctly, basically, in your code. And also about the gamification part. This is also important because having a password strength meter is good, as I said. But it's also important to remember you can't trust a password meter. Because what makes a strong password? Any suggestions? What is a strong password? Hi, Scott, uh, it's, <laughs> we are still going to have to talk about this again. No, it's not entropy. Uh, a strong password is, I mean, here's a website, how secure is my password? And I have entered my name, Per Thorsheim, and the system says, a hacker is going to use 923,000 years to crack that. Now. Me using my own name as my password. Do you think that's a good choice? Is that a strong password? No. no? If Scott is using Pertusheim as his password, would that be a good choice for him? It would be better. It's not incredibly secure, but it's better. That's a very simple way to tell you that no, you should not trust password meters. But again, implementing them to give the user a certain idea if your password is sort of strong is a very good idea to do. And then also the question of two-factor authentication. As I said, I'm joining up for your online store and I want to purchase shoes. 
I couldn't care less about your company, your services, or your shoes at the point in time now because the account has absolutely zero value to me. I haven't left my credit card, nothing in there. So, do we configure two-factor authentication now or at a later point? I already gave away my answer to that one. You ask the user to configure two-factor authentication as soon as they do something which could be important to them, like a financial transaction or entering any kind of sensitive data, as an example. But you have to be the judge on when and how to do this. Because again, as I said initially, use two-factor authentication everywhere. And how do we do two-factor authentication? Well, we use our phone most of the time. We receive text messages all the time with OTPs, we have TOTP apps, Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator, and God knows how many more. And people sometimes forget that people run out of battery. They don't have coverage in the area or in the country they're in. They have data turned off because they don't want to pay for expensive data packages. They... Uh, <laughs> uh, they lose their phone, they smash it, or it gets stolen. Something as simple as a company sending you an OTP by text message. And you have probably seen this a lot of times, but I'm pretty sure most of you have never really thought about it. The way you do that text message, parts of the text message will be given a preview on your lock screen in most phone configurations. So if the OTP is the only thing in the text message, you will see it even on a lock screen, on a locked phone, it will show up. But if that text message starts with, hi, here is your OTP, line break, line break, and then you have the OTP code, the OTP code by itself would not show up in the preview of the text message on screen. Very big difference in some threat scenarios. I do a bit, quite a bit of traveling, sitting in an airport lounge. Ha have you ever been to a cafe or, or airport lounge and see people like leave their phone and leave their laptop, maybe even open, to go to the men's room or uh, ladies' room? Well, they do that, and I'm, I'm sort of fine with that. When people tweet out picture, pictures on Twitter saying like, here's another idiot who just left his laptop unlocked in the cafe, and his phone as well, or her phone, I tweet back, back at them saying, then it's really good that you are there to look after it. <laughs> That's my response. Now, I was, uh, I, and if any of you are doing this, I'm sorry for saying this, but I was an asshole for quite a few years fucking with my colleagues who forgot to lock their laptop when they went away. I've changed into saying that if somebody forgot to lock the lap laptop, I will actually stay behind, even in a cafe, and it's a complete stranger, I will stay behind and just make sure that nobody runs away with that laptop. I won't go over there and just like, you know, Windows L to lock it, because it's not my computer, I'm not to touch it, but I would just look after it for the owner. And when the owner go gets back, depending on the person, I will eventually say, you know, I, I have a small tiny tip for you. Don't be that trustworthy. <laughs> and by the way, I'm a password hacker. So now you learn le your lesson. It's that simple. Now, I do work for, for VIPs in Norway. Uh, I do work with security for bank ID. And here's our login flow. First of all, we have an information screen. We're saying, hey, well, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to confirm your identity. And number two, enter username, which for bank ID is your social security uh, number. And then, here we are, well, in my case, I'm using um, an app. So I get a ping uh, in that app on my phone. Um, and I say, I confirm that it's me. And that's basically me entering the OTP. And if the OTP is correct, then I get to the screen where I need to enter my password. Notice the flow here. Because many services have two-factor authentication. Pretty much all of them, I have no idea. Scott, have you ever seen 
any service apart from Bank ID in Norway where they ask you for username and then they ask you for valid OTP and if that OTP is correct, then they ask you for your password. Nope. And I can't understand why not? Why they do, do, do it that way? Because when they ask for username and then password, it means that any password hacker can make as many attempts as they want if you don't have any account, account lockout or, or uh, rate limiting on your service. They will have multiple attempts at trying to guess people's password. But if you have to enter the correct OTP first, they will never get to the password screen where they can actually try to guess your password. It's a very small but incredibly important change of the login flow. I'm not saying this is the correct thing to do for everyone, but by all means look into if you can make that small change. So username, OTP, password. And also keep people informed about what you're doing and, and, and why you're doing it. And also give them information about, uh, you know, if, if, if for some reason you choose to do password, username and password, and eventually also OTP on the same screen. And if one of those are wrong, don't say something went wrong, try again. Don't do that. That's not good security, that's stupid security. Tell them that the username is wrong or the password is wrong or the OTP is wrong. That is helping the hacker just a little bit, but it's even more important to give useful information to your customers. Because we need to build trust with our users. This is uh, an article that I wrote for uh, Computer World Norway like 13 years ago or something. It's Norwegian. Um, you can still find it online. It's our official channels. I wrote this because I got annoyed by a lot of com companies that were sending me um, text messages, emails, and they even have had these pop-ups on their uh, online store. Uh, in, I actually wrote this because of my own bank. I entered my bank. I wanted to do some online banking, obviously. And when I enter the homepage of my bank, it's like, boom, here's a pop-up, like, would you like to answer a few questions about our bank? And if you participate, you can win some money. And the pop-up doesn't look like anything that is designed by the bank. And it's like, where this, does this pop-up come from? I mean, I'm at the bank, but I know this much. I cannot be totally sure that that pop-up actually comes from my bank. And there's no information. I, I remove the pop-up and I look at the bank's website and there's no information that they are running a marketing survey now. So what do I do? Well, I'm being a, what, not a Twitter troll, but a real world troll. I call my bank. I ask for the director of, of information, the you know, PR department. And I said, hi, this is Per. I'm a really fucking annoying customer. Are you running a marketing survey online on your website now? Yes or no? Um, uh, I, I need to check and get back to you. Yeah, because there's a pop-up coming on your homepage and there's no way to verify for me whether this is actually coming from the bank or if it is spam or fraud or, you know, I have no idea what. And that person called me back like two hours yet later and like, oh yeah, it's, it's a marketing survey. Oh, fine, thank you. And now to avoid me calling you again or anyone else calling you with the same question. Include some friggin' information about your website that in these days, starting this day and ending on this day, we are doing a marketing survey which will show up as a pop-up on screen or you can click here to participate because, you know, it is a bit annoying to get that pop-up because I'm not entering my bank to answer a marketing survey. I'm there to do online friggin' banking. So don't be annoying. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. So I wrote this article, and a lot of companies and organizations in Norway, they set up a single page on their website named Our Official Channels, or Our Channels, where they list all the channels they use for email, for social media, like here's our Facebook account, here's our Instagram page, here's uh, our TikTok account, here's uh, the email addresses we use to communicate with you, and they are being sent out by these third-party providers. It's a that simple web page to do. You don't have to update that, that page every week, every month, but it creates trust. 
for people like me at least, that are just a bit paranoid. And of course, you could also include the security.txt file. Everybody knows security.txt? Raise your hand. Do you know this one? And for those who don't know it, do it. Securitytext.org. It's a simple text file where you tell ethical hackers, you tell Scott, <laughs> that he, if he finds a vulnerability, here's how to contact us and report that to us. Incredibly simple. Lots of sites doesn't do this. And then suddenly we have a situation where, oh shit, I need to change my password. And I go online to your store again because I want to change my password. Now, you see a user coming there and they want to change your password. Wouldn't it be nice to just ask, why are you coming to us to change your password? Nobody does that. But it could it be that I want to change my password because I think somebody had obtained illegal access to my account? Like asking, hey, uh, you want to change your password? Fine. Uh, would you like to warn us about you know, somebody else being aware of your uh, password? Has your account been compromised by anyone or something? That simple question to ask. And in most cases, people just change their password because they want to change it. Uh, no. People don't do that. People change passwords for a reason, a security reason in most cases. So why not ask them, why are you changing your password? And talking about changing passwords, uh, Ricky Mondello and, um, I forgot her name, uh, Theresa at Apple, they have this one, a well-known URL for changing passwords. So you have a web page where people go to change their password, right? And here is a URL at a fixed location and password managers or anyone else, they can go to that specific URL, which is known, well known across all websites, if you configure it. And that again, that URL points to the page where you change your password. If you may implement this, and again, this is <laughs> easy to do, then password managers will also have a much better and easier job to help you change your password across many, many different sites and services. Why not help password managers and users to figure out where do I change my password? Because if you go into 10 different sites and say, I want to change my password, there are 10 different URLs, 10 different layouts and everything to change your password. Here's a fixed URL that you can configure, then again points to the page where you change your password. When Apple announced this, it was like, yes. I, and I've been doing this stuff now for, you know, password, passwords have been my interest for more than 23 years now, approximately. And I was like, shit, why didn't I think about that? But this is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And you should do this on any and all sites and services that are your, you are running online. That's my opinion. And there's a blog post as well that you can find on this address web.dev slash change password URL that explains it a little bit more and give you examples on how to do it if you want to read a little bit more about it. And you also have cases like, you know, I forgot my password. Now, I want to change my password is something different than I forgot my password. And you can also have people reporting in like, oh shit, I, have, I can't remember my username. Or I think my account has been compromised. Do you have any kind of process flow designed to handle those different cases? Because I forgot my password is interesting again to ask, well, did you forget your password? Or could it be that somebody have get, or, or obtained illegal access to your account and changed your password? So when you think you don't remember it, it's actually someone, someone who has changed your password. That could be the case. So you need to look for indicators of compromise there's a billion ways to do that. Ask Scott or ask Jim, uh, look at to Uvasp, not going into the details of that, uh, but it's a good smart thing to do. And something as simple as, well, um, I see that you are changing your password or you have forgotten your password. Now, under the assumption that you, when you say you forgot your password, you go into the password reset process. Should we also there ask you, are you doing this because you think somebody have gained legal access to your account? 
uh, you could, as an example, when you change your password successfully and get gain access again, should you show the user, hey, here are all your uh, valid session tokens or cookies or whatever you call them. Should you show them, you know, you are logged in from these devices, from these browsers, and would you like to kill those sessions? And in what cases would you ask the user, should we kill, the, kill these sessions? And under what circumstances should you just say, kill them all? Because we think or we know the account is compromised. I don't have the exact answer for you. You have to design this process. You have to do the risk analysis yourself. But it's, again, something that I very rarely see options for doing on, online on most sites. So I'm a big fan of US NIST and the standard called SP800-63B. This is for Digital Identity Guidelines, Authentication and Lifecycle Management. It was published in June 2017. If you are having sleeping problems, this is the paper for you to read. Uh, but this is brilliant. Uh, there's a ton of people that sort of worked or assisted with NIST uh, like myself, uh, doing conferences, doing talks, discussing up and down to eternity. And the output ended up on this standard, which says a lot that you should most definitely read and read again. Some of the highlights from this standard is saying that, well, you shouldn't do forced or regular password change. Hooray. You should drop the complexity requirements because simply a long password makes a strong password. If you use the letter A or the number 1 74 times, that can be sort of considered a really strong password. Because if somebody, if I'm supposed to, you know, I'm going to hack your account, what will I do? Well, password 1, exclamation mark, obviously. Oh, shit, no, that's the, that, that didn't work. Okay, uppercase P then, or maybe two exclamation marks. And how many attempts will a hacker try out against an online form before they get tired or you hit a rate limiting uh, or eventually also the account is locked out? Very few. Online hacking is a very slow process to do. Cormac Hurley at Microsoft Research wrote a paper saying that for the online, online attack scenario, it doesn't make sense to make, do more than, say, 1,000 to maybe 10,000 attempts. When you've done that and you can't get access, move on to the next account and try to get in. But for offline brute force hacking of passwords, that means I have a password hash of your password and I use powerful NVIDIA GPU clusters to crack your password, working at hundreds of billions of, of attempts per second, then it's a completely different ball game. But what people forget all the time is that if somebody have been able to gain access to your password hash from some kind of service, that service is already royally hacked up and down. And there's actually no point in cracking your password for that service because your data is already gone. They have already gained access to your data. Cracking your password through offline brute force cracking using a, a Hashcat and, and NVIDIA GPUs that is something they do to order refine your data so they can try to use your account information and the password to gain access to other sites and services on, on the internet as well. But there's, you know, initially there's no point in cracking your password like that. And people forget that. So one of the things that I did in my previous job, I was working as the chief security officer of Nordic Choice Hotels, a large hotel chain in Scandinavia. When I started there in 2017, I said, well, I want to implement the NIST SP800-63B standard for passwords at no choice hotels. And my colleagues, they look at me like, yeah, whatever. And I talked to the uh, communications department internally, and I said, well, there's a few challenges here. Um, one of the things I did was to implement the open password filter, which you can find on uh, GitHub. I, I think it's still there. Um, this is <laughs> it's a password filter <laughs> for Windows. And again, referring back to Cormac Hurley, 
if you do block the 1,000 to 10,000 most popular passwords on the internet, you'll be fine. Just don't allow users, your customers, to use the top 1,000 or 10, top 10,000 passwords. Don't allow them to use those because those are too easy to guess. So we were in a hotel, or no choice, a hotel chain in Scandinavia, 18,000 employees, six countries, 210 locations, and 170 different nationalities working for the hotel chain at the time. That was uh, uh, before the pandemic. So I talked to the communications department and said, hey, um, I want to implement the NIST standard, so I'm going to remove the complexity requirements. Hooray! I want to set the minimum length for passwords to 15. You're going to die, motherfucker. So I talked to them. I need to communicate this in a good way. And again, very small difference. From now on, your password has to be 15 characters. but you don't have to make it complex. Uh, you never have to change your password again! Yes! But it has to be 15 characters long. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I've been asking that, those questions for people for years and years to end. And just the order of communicating this is incredibly important. So, would you like to never have to change your password again is the message we communicated to the employees at Nordic Choice. And to no surprise, everybody was like, I'll do anything <laughs> 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 to not have to change my password ever again. Well, unless, of course, we think or we know that your password has been compromised, then obviously we need to do something. So we sent out a message, and the big header, of course, was like, now you don't have to change your password ever again. But we are increasing the minimum length from 8 characters to 15 characters. And we didn't say anything about removing the password complexity requirement. That's excess information. It's really not needed to give it out. And I was re really curious what's going to happen now. You know, what happened next when we send out this message? Absolutely nothing. I didn't even get a hug. <coughs> Nobody responded to that message. And I was like, that's weird. I, I, I know I'm in security, so I know that some people sort of like don't like me or like us. But again, it was, it was strange to experience. Um, so some of the things that I do to explain why did I do this, because just implementing the standard, yes, but there needs to be a reason. And then one of the things that I did before implementing this change, I talked to uh, our internal help desk. And I asked them, do you, you know, make a note of all requests that you have? Yes, we have really good tracking of all issues being reported to us. Well, do you also register like, you know, I forgot my password? Oh, <laughs> yes, we do. So I asked for statistics. And if, if you see on the top left corner, it says, Pers Paversa Passo Passage. It's a Swedish uh, colleague uh, who, who wrote that, and I promised him to leave it on the slide because he, he thought I was a complete nutcase, which I sort of am, about passwords. So he created statistics for me, uh, and I, what I was asking for was basically, how many requests do we have per day, week, month, year, of the kind that says, I forgot my password? Because in a large corporation, what happens when somebody have forgotten their password. Well, they make another try, or three attempts, or five attempts. And then they, uh, they, then they just, oh, it's shit, it's, I forgot, it's Monday. So I'd grab some coffee, I would talk to some colleagues, and then I would get back to my computer and I will make three more attempts. And after some time, they will finally resign and that shit, I have to call help desk. Now, the time wasted by that employee, because they are not being productive when this happens, and then you also have the time needed by help desk to verify, is it actually you or is it somebody trying to pretend to be you to gain access to your account? I said, and this is, this is just like that, I said that it's a one hour, there's one hour of lost productivity to the company 
for every single I forgot my password request to help desk. That's the cost, one hour. And I saw that I, if I could reduce the number of forgot password requests by 50%, I would be saving the company 16, 1,500, 1,600 hours every year. And that's just saving time, saving money, but that's also a lot more happy employees, which is also something positive. So I saw that after changing uh, the password policy, uh, boring uh, statistics, we saw that the number of lost password requests dropped rapidly, which was really, really good. And I was traveling around in Norway and Sweden and Denmark, and I was talking to employees in the hotels. Did you notice that you haven't changed your password for like more than a year now? Huh. Yeah, that's true. Is there something wrong? No, 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 no. No, it was actually me changing the policy. Oh, thank you. It's a lifesaver for me. Okay, well, yeah, nice to hear that, and you're welcome. Uh, do I get a room upgrade now? But uh, yeah, I. So a lot of people are sending also out OTPs even by email. They are sending out, you know, verify your email, uh, click this link, and so on. Now, email is not secure. Uh, the Norwegian NCSC, um, uh, Security Authority of Norway, say, says that it's not, and email is and remains the most important initial attack vector in order to insert malware inside an organization or network. So the confirm your email, sign, click here to sign up for our service, or here's your OTP, or here is your password reset link. You really need to be aware those are incredibly effective attack vectors as well. So I'm not saying you shouldn't be using email, but you really think, need to think about the process flow of this. One of the things you can do is to look at the uh, Digital Science Directorate in Norway, uh, the government. They have some standards that are recommended on how to make email at least a little bit more secure. And I know from experience and research that most uh, companies in Norway, they haven't deployed the standards, internet standards, uh, recommended by Norwegian government, and the most funny part of it, the two government organizations, including Digital Science Directorate, that do recommend these from back in 2018, even they haven't implemented these standards themselves yet, which is funny, I guess, but I'm nagging them all the time to do it, because it's not hard when you know how to do it. And the Super Financial Authority of Norway also said many years ago that, yes, we think that in the future, uh, this is in 2013, we do expect a lot of people to get their phones hacked. I uh, have a girlfriend now for three years. Uh, I think it was one of the first evenings she visited me. Uh, you know, I had turned down the lights, uh, something to eat and drink, uh, watching a romantic movie on Netflix. <laughs> um, and suddenly her phone says, ping. And I'm like, yeah, you can check that, of course, if you like. And I just put the movie on pause. And she starts typing on her phone, and I'm like, yeah, fine. Yeah, you know, do whatever you need to. And after some time, she suddenly says, is it normal that Netflix is asking for my social security number? And I'm like, OK, lights on, TV off, romance is dead, give me your phone, please. That's the text message. Uh, if you don't understand Norwegian, I'm pretty sure you can uh, uh, understand from what's at the bottom. It's like Netflix saying, hey, there's something wrong with your account. And she was just about to give away everything, uh, bank ID and OTP, password and so on, uh, to the bad people. So my phone is my castle, and that's where people have their secrets these days. And I'm going very quickly through this, but I've been talking before about how, uh, how I can hijack your phone. Uh, there were some broad pass press coverage on that in 2019 in Dog and Snag Sleeve, the newspaper, uh, which I was sort of behind, uh, where we show that we could easily hijack your phone. And I also show that for at least 10 to 13 years, uh, it had been possible to break into and listen to and manipulate the voice mailbox of approximately six to seven million people in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark using spoofing uh, and worse, 
uh, there was an article in Norwegian news media in 2006 or in 2007 that in detail described how to do it. But the telecom operators in Norway didn't notice, so it went unnoticed and unfixed until I brought it into the media in 2019. And, of course, I did it responsibly, so they fixed it before they ended up in the news. So, going quickly uh, through these, and I did a joke on pins and, uh, yesterday. Um, here are these students that I asked about the pin code, but some interesting statistics. Some of the most common four-digit pins. Look at them and see if you can identify your own. One, two, three, four, uh, quad zero, two, five, eight, zero. Look at your phone and you will figure out why two, five, eight, zero is very popular. It's just a line straight down. But five, six, eight, three is the funny one. Five, six, eight, three, does it ring a bell? Anyone here old enough to have been using T9 on a mobile phone to text many, many years ago? 5683 is the English word love. So you remember love, which is something you want to remember in most cases, and you type in 5683. That's love. So one of the most common pin codes you can find. So I've been doing research into people's choice in, in pin codes as well. It's uh, funny. As an example, uh, I asked people to generate four-digit memorable PIN codes, four-digit non-memorable, and also seven-digit memorable PIN codes in Norway. In Norway, there's absolutely nothing that we use in our uh, daily lives that contains seven digits. So when I asked people to generate a seven-digit memorable PIN code, people were like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it's also funny to see that if you ask them to create a memorable pin, they will not be using uh, the number six. And also, four-digit non-memorable, they will not be using the number zero. It's basically not, it's not random enough. So very few people will be using zero in the pin code, as an example. And you could do crazy statistics on this. You can generate heat maps showing to you that uh, these are the two first digits of the pin, and these are the two last digits of the pin. So you have pin code starting with 19, and going up here, it's a strong blue line, so it's year of birth. And this more or less block down here is basically birth dates. Day and month. And the line that goes up here, that's 0000, zero, zero, zero going all the way up to 9999. Nine, nine, nine. So as an example, 5555 is a very popular pin code. Can you code something for me online where people can enter a pin code and generate a heat map like that? I'm willing to ship you a dollar or two for doing that. It's a very, uh, I think it is a simple thing to do. Now the fun thing is, in the research world, we can essentially say that if I can steal 11 credit cards by the end of the day in here. The only thing I know is that you have chosen the four-digit PIN code yourself. I don't know gender, age, or origin, or anything about you. But I do know use a chosen PIN, and I know that I have three attempts bef before the card stopped working. 11 cards, statistically, I will be able to guess the correct PIN code on one in 11 cards. Awesome statistics if you're working in a pub. So creating a long memorable pin, again. The Norwegian name Johansson translates into 56426736. And you don't have to remember the pin, you just remember the name Johansson. So some of us are dreaming of FIDO and WebAuthn. Uh, if you haven't, if you don't know about this, you really should look into it. I'm dreaming of it, uh, about it as well, and it looks like something like this, a YubiKey or other devices that may have or may not have a fingerprint reader as an example. And WebAuthn is fantastic. It's uh, proven, you know, you can't fish anyone using WebAuthn authentication. But there are problems with it. At Nordic Choice uh, uh, Hotels, here's one of the hotels uh, where I do visit frequently. 
This is the reception, uh, reception area, and they have these nice, big, really good-looking computers standing on the desk, and here's the payment terminal. And the funny problem is that the USB ports are only on the back of the screen, so they are facing you, the customer, the user, the bad guys. Now, if you do insert a UB key in there, what do you think might happen? Somebody will just, ah, oh, I'll take that, please. And suddenly, they will not be able to log in. And also, from a usability perspective, they stand in front of the screen to log in, but then they have to reach back to go behind the reception to click on the button to be able to log in. Very simple usability stuff, but again, in some cases, cases it's just hard to implement. So I will end this by telling you why you should write down your passwords. And I will do that. It's a video. It's a one minute long. I made this many, many years ago. And I will do the uh, voiceover because uh, the original is in Norwegian. Uh, so here we go. Why you should write down your passwords. To our young ones. Dear mom and dad, if you are reading this letter, I have probably gone missing against my own will. In this letter, I have written down usernames and passwords for the sites and services that I use for my phone, email, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, and so on. This is information that you and the police may need to, in order to be able to find me. Please remember that I love you. And she inserts that into an envelope, and then on the outside of that envelope it says, for emergency purposes only. Because electronic traces are being more and more important for people, for the police, to find you, to find us, if we go missing. And this is a reality which is happening, unfortunately, way too often. And that's why you should write down your password, and that's why you should recommend your family and friends to do so as well, put it in the envelope that says for emergency purposes only, and give that envelope to somebody you trust. Thank you. <laughs> Slightly over time, but I will stick around for at least 30 minutes. So if you have questions or comments, feel free. A Take a few questions. Okay. Questions? The, uh, again, I said eight hours. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you believe me now. I can actually go on for eight hours. But this was a very ultra brief introduction to the topic, and there's so much more I could have talked about. Yes? You recommend that you do OTP before you do passwords. I feel like that is it's convenient for bank ID because we know that everyone has an OTP. It doesn't still work for services where OTP. Well, there's one attack that you can do against this. I, I'm the kind of guy who thinks like an attacker most of the time. So just recently there have been articles, uh, I'm not sure if there's academic research, but there has been articles out in the press saying that um, if there's a login form where I enter a username and then OTP, but the OTP will be TOTP and you're using Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator, then I can just hit that again and again and again and again and again. Uh, and if you are using an online app where you get a notification like Microsoft Authenticator, would you like to, is it you trying to log in? If I just hit that many, many, many times, in the end, because your phone will go bing, 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 do you want to allow access or not? It has been shown that a lot of people are just getting annoyed and they think, I've said no, 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 and it doesn't go away, okay, yes. And then the attacker gets in. So that's one of the many risks that you have to consider in this. So I said that it could be a good flow to do. I'm not saying it's the best way to do it in all circumstances, no. More questions? Yep. What's your recommendation when a company has clients who hold on to the obsolete uh, password requirements, like um, complexity, password rotation? I'm... I'm, I'm I have a full-time job. <laughs> I don't do consulting. I'm not allowed to do consulting, but I am allowed to do free talks. So uh, set up um, a seminar for your customers 
and invite me and uh, maybe I can convince them. That's, that's what I usually say. Uh, you know, calling them idiots is not going to work, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions? Okay, once again, thank you. I'll be around uh, a little more.